So hi, good evening. I am Stephen Smith, the Executive Director here at the Amazon Foundation. Welcome. As Nathan just mentioned, this is the inaugural um, event of the Amazon Dialogue Speaker Series. And we really hope it will be the first in a long line of events that we hope to continue to hold here in this space uh, to continue to build dialogue and exchange among the watching community and beyond. So thank you so much for being here to, uh, as the first um, audience, if you will, participants in this event. Welcome, welcome. Um, I'd like to take a minute or two to introduce our foundation for some of you who are not familiar with us. Uh, we're not really a household name so far. But the foundation uh, has been around since 1998. Uh, was established in New York City. Our first office was in the World Trade Center, Tower One, which was, of course, destroyed. And we eventually uh, migrated to here, uh, Washington, D.C., in this space. Um, we are a nonprofit, non governmental organization. Uh, our mission is to promote and implement programs that facilitate cultural exchange and educational cooperation around the world. Our honorary chairman, until very recently, was. Uh, Dr. Boutros Boutros Ghali, former U.S. Secretary General, who I'm sad to report passed away just a few months ago. And we um, recently created an endowed fund in his honor. Um, so we are very grateful to all the contributions he has made to the foundation over the years. Uh, the programs that we have been implementing since we moved to this space and even before, some of them um, include the Amazon Year in China program, we call AYC. And this program, since its inception in 2012, has sent over 400 recent American college graduates to teach English in China for an academic year. Uh, we're probably going to send another 100 or so this fall. I'm not sure what the numbers are, but we're still working on that. Um, another program we're very proud of is the Sino-American Youth Ambassador Program, which brings Chinese high school students to live with American students and uh, go to their high schools with them for a week, normally during the Chinese Lunar New Year period. And annually we bring over about 150 students and they go to high schools all around the country. Um, we also have a program which is called ACE. It's a program um, through which we send American, French, British, and Russian students to China to participate in a summer camp that's based on a, it's a model, I have to get this right, I always forget the acronym, but the CPPCC, the China People's Political Consultative Conference, which is somewhat akin to the lower house in the United States, except it does not pass any laws. But the students go and they meet and mingle, live together, and they come up with proposals that uh, are competitively selected. The winning proposal then is passed on to the real CPPCC. Okay. Uh, we've also launched, not long ago, our program called PPP, Professional Pathways Program. And very successfully, just tell the event at Georgia Washington University in March, end of March, uh, the program brought, uh, I believe there were total around 300 uh, mostly Chinese college students from all around the East Coast who came to learn about opportunities uh, both to return and find uh, jobs in China, but also uh, to potentially legally remain in the United States to work and pursue uh, opportunities here, uh, even if it's only short term. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, I'm not going to go into all of our programs because the focus is here is not all about Amazon, but I also want to, again, thank you that with the support of all of you, this is now our newest program. You're here at the infancy of Amazon Dialogue Speaker Series. So thank you so much for coming to this. And I also want you to join me in thanking all of our Amazon staff who have not only helped implement the programs, but who are helping out here tonight. So please join me in giving them a round of applause. And now, it's my great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Mr. Ted Gohm. Ted is a man who wears many hats. He is the director of the 1882 
Project Foundation, the president of the DC chapter of the Chinese American Citizens Alliance. Prior to his retirement from government service in 2012, Ted was a career diplomat in the US Department of State, where he served primarily in East Asia on policy and operational issues related to border management security, migration and refugees and consular affairs. Having attended the University of California, University of Hawaii, and the U.S. Army War College, Ted has degrees in history, Asian studies, and national strategic studies. And to coin a phrase, e pluribus una, right? We are, as Americans, we are a nation of immigrants whose ancestors left their birthplaces to brave rivers and oceans, <coughs> uh, treks across deserts and difficult borders, and sometimes even had to brave air turbulence to come to our great nation uh, in modern times. And they've come here and helped to build this country we call our home, the United States of America. We're fortunate this evening to have uh, Ted, who's going to share his perspectives on the 1882 Foundation um, and the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, its eventual repeal, and the experience of generations of Chinese and other Asian Americans in the United States. Ted, welcome. So it's um, it's such an honor actually to be the uh, to be uh, invited here to be inaugurated this new series. I think it's going to be a great series, and uh, all of you pay attention to what Nathan's going to be producing and inviting you to come to. You know, one of the things that uh, you know. Uh, I, I actually created this uh, slide lecture some time ago for something else, and, and part of it was uh, is a, a time that went, I went back to Sacramento. And in Sacramento, I was there, and you're at this small state university, and I was sitting around thinking, oh, this really smells like my own hometown, right? Because I don't know if you guys know what the valley, Central Valley is like and so forth like this. And later on, I had a portion this, this uh, slideshow done at Mississippi, and Stan, my good friend, is here, and we had this Mississippi uh, crowd of 300 plus Mississippi Chinese, and one of the first things I asked was just, how many of you guys actually worked in a grocery store? Right. So I, I, I'm just curious, how many of you guys actually worked in a small family store in a rural area? The one Mississippi Chinese person. In that Mississippi Chinese group, it was like 89% of these guys all had this shared common experience with me in this little photo here, uh, you know, where there's hardly anything really Chinese about this cotton picking and so forth like that. Let me see if I get this little pointer here. There's a difference between, uh, you know that in our family story, uh, these uh, shops, there's a period in which you're just about to close the store and everybody sits there waiting for you to turn that sign over and you say close and you go home. And it's at that place where you begin to start sharing stories. So one of the people that really uh, affected me, of course, was my mother. And uh, there's a photo of her in 1939. And what I want to say is there are storytellers and there are historians. And I'm not a historian. Uh, I'm a, uh, I, I like to hear people tell stories. Stan and I always say that. We don't know what we're doing. We just like people telling stories, and we like telling our stories itself. So one of the stories my mother used to tell me, and this is when she was, uh, uh, she used to say things at our store as we're knitting and waiting for the closing of the store. She says, you know, Ted, I came to the United States twice. I actually came to the United States twice. And the first time, they didn't let me in. I said, they didn't let you in. He said, no, they didn't let me in because my ears. And I was saying, how, how can that be? How can it be that people just want So we just said, well, that's another one of mom's story. She always tells these funny stories about, you know, how my father was an opium, my father's father was an opium addict. She talks about Kong. She talks about rabbits in the moon and stuff. That's just one of her stories. But, you know, what? as I grew older and I began to study certain things, I realized there was something called the Chinese Exclusion Law. And this is a copy of that law made in 1882. And basically, there are two provisions there that are important for us. 
Chinese were prohibited from immigrating to the United States, and, uh, and as importantly, Chinese were prohibited from becoming American citizens. Now, the other thing to remember in terms of telling stories is remember this person. This is uh, 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 Wang Kim Ark. I really like this photograph. Because you look at him, he's just this young man who's confident and he's doing, but his case went to the Supreme Court. And what he did was, in the previous photo of where my mother was, she was at, that actually is a photograph of her, we'll go back, that's a photograph of her stopped in California. The first time she tried to enter, she couldn't enter because of her ears. That's what she says. And she was case number 393396-8. And what they did was, we don't believe you're an American citizen. And we don't believe your identity. We're going to hold you in this detention facility in, in, in a place called Angel Island in San Francisco. This guy uh, came to the United States, the same place, San Francisco, but there was no question of his identity. There was no question that he was born in the United States. The question for him was whether or not a, a person ineligible to immigrate to the United States and ineligible to become a citizen, could that person become an American citizen? That's the case. That's the case with the Supreme Court, and that was determined that under the 14th Amendment, if you're born in the United States, you're an American citizen. That, that birthright citizenship that was so critical in today's immigration debates, and for us, many of us, our citizenship was made by this young man here, in this case here. Another person to know is, again, telling stories. When I was looking at my mother's immigration files one time, I found this photograph of this young person. I'd seen a photograph like this before in some of my family photo albums. I never knew who this person was. But then I found out that she's actually my aunt, somebody named Lola Gong. And that's a picture of her in 1932. So what happened in the Chinese immigration laws, uh, when you left the United States as a Chinese born in the United States, you were also required to get documents to prove that you were born in the United States so that when you come back, you could re-enter. So she had gone back to China at that age in, in 1932. She was born in California. She came back. Uh, she went over to Asia and got some documents, went back to China. Now she died in China. I never knew I had this aunt. But that death for her meant an opportunity for my mother to come in. So she tried to pretend that she was this person, Lola Gong, from the United States. Now, in those days, when you got into, when you arrived at the immigration station, you didn't kind of look at your visa documents, and there's nothing like that. In those days, what happened is that the immigration officers who didn't believe who you were began to ask questions. And what they do is to compare, photo, that quite the purpose of the question is to compare what you said, what others have said, about the place that you came. The idea being that if you can know what uh, these villages were like, and they matched what other people said, and that would help affirm your identity. So these are diagrams, the things that I show you. These are diagrams, what we call uh, coaching books. The idea was that the people who were coming to the United States would memorize all this stuff, right, so that you could pretend that who you were or who you were. And so these are some of the things that you had to do. These are documents, uh, the statement there is actually from a coaching book, which is represented in that diagram over there, supposedly of this village, right, this village. And you have to know things, you have to remember your village face south, the number of houses it has on the left to the right. Was there a wong in front of your house or was there not a wong? How many chickens were there in the house? You know, this kind of stuff like this. This is what they did. See, and so my mother had, this is actually a, a shot of the village where my uh, grandparents, my parents actually came from. So my mother had to remember that she came from here and that actually is a set of the questions the immigration officers actually asked my mother. You can find those in the National Archives. These are the type of questions. Imagine, she's 15 years old, and she's traveled across the United States on a, uh, on a ship that's probably a, you know, a month long, gets to the Angel Island uh, Angel the Detention Center, and the immigration officer goes, did someone take you to school when you first started in school? Why didn't your grandmother or your grandfather do this? Do you remember? Are you guessing? And it goes on and on and on. You told us that the house you lived in only had one room. Now are you saying that, did you live in that house? Are you? This is the type of things that went through that interrogation for many people, including my mother. She didn't do so good. 
She didn't memorize, she didn't memorize the, the story very well. She couldn't pretend to be Lola Gong. So in the end, what they did was they took the photograph. That's the, on, on this is April 1932, is the photograph of Lola Gong, who took these photographs on leaving the United States, 1932. Seven years later, this person comes and claims to be Lola Gong. So the question for the immigration officer, is this person the same person seven years later? So uh, they got together a panel, they looked at it, they compared it. You know, remember in those days there's no DNA, certainly, there's no fingerprints even. And so in the end, the, doc, the conclusion was this, and this, this is the conclusion. The formation of the inner gulf of the ear is markedly different. <laughs> I know a distinct dissimilarity in the shape of the applicant's ear. So my mother was right. It really was her ear that kept her out of the United States. And so she was told to get on a boat, and she was sent back to China. And at that time, uh, the war with Japan had, had, I think a year later, uh, Japan marches into Hong Kong. But the cause of the exclusion is this, very succinctly stated. Cause of the exclusion, applicant is an alien of the Chinese race. And that's the Chinese exclusion law. Now one of the things we tend to think about is that there was one law, 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act. In fact, there are a series of laws that went starting in 1870 all the way down to, uh, until they get repealed in 1943, but you have all these laws. And the first thing that we did in the 1882 project, we started with the 1870 Immigration Nationality. So one thing is, these are, these are all federal laws. These are all laws passed by Congress. So we're not talking about the laws that were being passed in the states. We're not talking about the laws that were passed in the various cities and ordinances. 1870 was actually uh, an amendment, and that started the, the Chinese exclusion law. One of the things is that Congress, after the Civil War, was trying to make all the laws consistent uh, with uh, what happened in the, the 14, 13, 14, 15 amendment. And one of the things was the nationality law. And the nationality law said something like this. Uh, white men, white male of good character could become American citizens. So what happened was that uh, Sumner, Senator Sumner, uh, wanted to take out, to make it consistent with, uh, with, uh, with uh, 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 the, the, the different laws and the and Civil War, the, the, the reasons for that, the equality things. And so what he wanted to do was just take out the adjective white so he actually proposed an amendment to that law of nationality that says all persons of good character could become American mm -hmm. citizens. And that uh, was passed, actually was approved, uh, that amendment, but it, the law was not yet passed. And then what happened was that another senator, a senator by the name of uh, uh, Stewart from Nevada, said, wait a minute. I understand that we have just fought a war and African Americans should be included in this provision. But if you put it the way you phrase it, that means Chinese can become citizens too, as all persons, right? And so he didn't, he, had, he was facing a problem in Nevada and the issue and uh, workers and laborers who, who were controversial. So this, this he refused to, uh, he basically filibustered the law, that law, until that portion was taken out. And so it became something like all white people and African Americans can become naturalized American citizens. And that was the beginning of, uh, in many ways, the official state, beginning of Congress's uh, uh, exclusion laws. In 1875, the Page Act. Page was a congressman from between Sacramento and Lake Tahoe area. And what he proposed was, oh, I can't, the thought was that let's, let's pass this law that says we cannot have prostitutes coming into California, right? So in a way, he, he was addressing issues like the trafficking, which we, we think we should support. He was addressing criminal issues and so forth. And so he proposed this law that prohibits Mongolian prostitutes. Of course, in California, he didn't think about Russian. He didn't think about other, other, other types of nationalities going here. And the way that it was applied was applied virtually to all Chinese. And his intention later on, you could say, he says, do you want to renew this law in eight, af after 1882? And he says, no, I don't need to renew this law because the 1882 law did what I wanted to do, that is to prevent Chinese from coming to the United States. 
1882 law was passed, it was actually vetoed the first time, and then it was passed again for a 10-year period. 1884, the question was, if you exclude the Chinese, then what about those that are coming from Hong Kong? Are they not British colonists? Are they British? What about those from the Philippines? So this law specifically said it was based on race, that they knew what they were doing. In 1884, uh, uh, that's what that happened in the Scott Act, what happened is the original act allowed people to be grandfathered in. If you're already a Chinese, you could get these re-entry permits and go back to China and then come back in. But 1888 Scott, uh, Scott Act made sure, they, there was perception that people were misusing that. So they said that all of these permits that were issued are no longer valid. So you had about 20,000 people with these permits who, and some of them are in the stage of coming back to the United States, were suddenly told you're not allowed to come back to the United States. In 19, 1892, the act was renewed because it was 10-year validity. That's the Geary Act, and the Geary Act added a requirement that all Chinese had to carry a registration certificate. So a lot of people boycotted that act, thinking it was unconstitutional because it was, a, it was like adding a dog tag to people. But never the, the Supreme Court ruled that it was still valid because it was an immigration regulation, and government has the right to regulate immigration. And then in 1902, it was extended again. And in 1904, it was made permanent. Each year, it was renewed 10 years. And then in 1904, it was made permanent. That's the Chinese exclusion law. Now, the Chinese exclusion laws in the 1882 project, we talk about it only in terms of what Congress did. We actually, in the 1882 project, did not talk a lot about the, the sort of hogans and the things like that that were happening in, in the states. But there are consequences, and that's what we need to remember, the stories related to that. And here's a picture of, there were uh, riots in Seattle, in Denver there were lynchings, in, Cal in Los Angeles there were lynchings. The one in Oregon is quite interesting, 1886. You don't really can't see the top part. It says, the bottom says, you can go or you can stay. The choice is yours. It's legal, I mean, do you want to stay? Uh, if you want to go, then go, because it's illegal to be here. You want to stay, then you get, uh, that's what happens to you. It sort of reminds you of the current immigration debate that says something like, what part of illegal do you not understand? What is, this is interesting, this is 1906, so the law had just been uh, uh, renewed to be permanent. And what is interesting about this is actually a photograph, and it's 1906. So we don't need to think about it. It, it somehow makes us think that uh, it's not just a historical abstraction for us. And these people, uh, what they're doing, and you have the young girls and other people around you, what they did was they round up the Chinese in that area. This is in Humboldt Bay, just in Northern California. Gathered them up, put them in these railroad truck cars, and shipped them off. And you think about, oh my goodness, what other event in modern history involved rounding up ethnic people and putting them into, ethnic, into railroad cars to get out. So there are a lot of reasons for the exclusion laws, uh, economic, labor, politics, racism. We're not going to really uh, get into it uh, very much. But I did want to talk about this one statement uh, by the Honorable J. Page, the same guy that passed the Page Law. So the question was, why are you Chinese complaining about that? Everybody knew immigrants had that issue. Irish had that issue, the other people had the issue. And he said, and he said yeah, but those guys actually uh, uh, overcame that prejudice, and then they actually fought for the United States. They became Americans. <clears throat> so I wanted to show you these photographs. <clears throat> this is a picture of uh, Joseph Pierce in the Civil War, and, that, and the other one is Victor Schoen in the World War II. So I like this photograph because, you know, you, again, you look at the stories that they represent, and uh, the, there were Chinese in the Civil War. How many people really knew that? And the Chinese were there on both sides, both the North and the South. And this is one of those people. You wouldn't know it by his name, Joseph Pierce, <laughs> but he is a Chinese. The funny thing, of course, is that when we were kind of, some people were looking to research how many Chinese actually were in the Civil War. So you kind of look at the names, you know, like Gong and Lam and Lee. And then I said, oh yeah, 
our most famous Robert E. Lee, right? So, but nobody, bought, nobody bought that story, so we had to do this. But Victor Schoen was actually a pilot in World War II. And what people don't understand is we do know that Japanese Americans, for example, fought the 442nd and 100th segregated battalion, a very honorable, the most highly decorated battalion. They actually uh, fought while they, uh, many of their family were in internment camps. Chinese actually uh, didn't have segregated units. Uh, there is something with, the, with uh, their support of the Burma theater. But many of them were like Victor Shum. They were integrated into the Air Force, and he is actually a pilot there. The interesting thing is that he flew these D-17s over, uh, over Europe. And uh, one of the interesting things was this pipe, uh, the crew got awards for having completed so many, so many bombings, and he was excluded for whatever reason. Uh, we don't know exactly why, it could be some of the reasons. But it's not just China, China men. There are actually China women warriors. And this one is pers one person I, I, I would recommend you to, to, to know and to uh, understand. And I like to talk about her story from this photograph, because sometimes I do this with high school students from Thomas Jefferson or Woodson High School. It says, well, it looks like one of your classmates here. So you can imagine in Wu, before the war, 1940s, you have this young woman who was born in Oregon, and her name was Hazel, and she wanted to fly. So how many of you, just in terms of just being a woman and trying to learn to fly and do things that's quite that's quite r remarkable. So she wanted to fly, she learned to fly, and when the war broke out, she decided that she was going to go back to China and try to help in that war. She actually tried to join some of the, some of the, the Chinese Air Force there. And of course, they wouldn't accept her, right? So she stayed there and then started flying these large uh, refugee-type flights from mainland to Hong Kong and so forth. When, after the United States entered the war and there was a formation of the woman air, uh, the air support, the WASP, the Women Air Corps people, she returned to China and became one of those people. So what the WASP did, and they were just recently honored by a uh, gold medal, and they were just recently honored to be allowed to be buried in Congressional Cemetery, actually. Because, uh, but in any case, she flew, and what these, these women did were amazing. They were flying the best, the most modern airplanes, planes that were being built. They had, were transporting them from manufacturers to different places, testing them, and when people uh, were flying, the men were learning to fly combat planes, they would fly the plane with that little trailer, that bubble is in the back, flying this run, and then the men would try to shoot it down, <laughs> and we were doing things like this. So she was actually uh, involved in flying some, uh, a group of, of planes, uh, PE-64, you know, this, they're the fighter planes, and the squadron they were moving from the East Coast to uh, Alaska to be staged to be entered into the war in Russia. And uh, the plane had to refuel in uh, North Dakota, in that area. So the squadron was coming in, and, and it was around Thanksgiving Day, just near the end, almost, the, almost toward the end of the war. But it was flying in, and there were, the, her plane and another plane crashed. And they had to drag her out. Her flight suit was burning, that jacket was just burning. And she was, uh, she was in the, the care, intensive care for three days, and she died. Germany was killed. So within a matter of a couple of weeks, you had these two people killed in this family. And the answer to the question of where were we, where were the Chinese family? Well, we, we were here. We were always here. People just weren't paying attention. But one of the, the final footnote on her is when the brother and she, Hazel, went back to be buried in the cemetery where the family selected in the Oregon area. They couldn't be buried there. No Chinese allowed. So these are the Chinese exclusion laws, but the war had an impact. And this is toward American inclusion. So instead of in exclusion, 1943, the Chinese exclusion laws were rescinded because China is an ally of the United States, but we were limited to 105 applicants per year. And then uh, a more important one was the 1945 War Brides Act, and that allowed women, foreign women, whether they were Italians or Germans, married to American GIs, 
to come to the United States despite the limitations on the numbers, 105. That's the basis of which my mother came back the second time. So she came back legally as herself. 65 is the Hard Seller Act, which we recently celebrated. And 2011, uh, the 1882 uh, project, uh, got con sent the Senate to pass unanimously a resolution that acknowledged the wrong of these laws, the harm to Chinese Americans, that it, Amer Chinese Americans, condemned the Chinese exclusion laws, and it affirmed Congress's commitment to protect the civil rights of all people in the United States. A year later, the House passed the resolution unanimously. What would be very useful is that we get the president to make a statement of apology as the next step. But here are some of the people that are involved in the 1882 project that got the congressional resolutions passed, which we want to start mobilizing or getting together to talk about the presidential statement of apology. Uh, this is a, I love this photograph because, you know, these guys went to a congressman to get them, get this congress, congressman Rick Hart to support the resolutions. And they're about the same age as my mother when she first came in. These guys, uh, I just love this, and this ability for us to get these people to come and for the congressman to support, it's amazing. So at the end of the day, the story is about them and not necessarily about the past. It's impossible, and it's about us, all Americans. It's impossible to preserve the integrity of government like ours if we deny to any class in our community equal protection law. The 1882 Project is about American founding principles. Equality, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, civil rights, and how the rule of law can be so wrong. All those laws were passed democratically by elected people. They knew what they were doing, but it was still passed and it was still wrong. What is good about the apology is the strength of our political institution. What other country can we go to make a presentation and they actually admit that they did something wrong? So by doing this, we actually affirm the strength of our our institutions. It's about honoring our forebears, like my mother. So what we want to do is, in the 1882 Foundation, is we have three program initiatives. Things to do uh, beyond just sort of having passed the resolution. How do you continue the education? Talk story, curriculum, lesson plans, in the 1882 symposium. Talk story is basically oral histories. How do we collect them? For if you guys can see uh, here, uh, one of the things we do is we create little film projects and collect them. Saturday, we have a presentation at the uh, Smithsonian uh, Anacostia Museum, and it will be showing a little video that we collected about the 1968 riots, April 1960 riots, and the impact on Chinatown. But what is important about these talk stories is the concept is that it allows us to tell our own stories truthfully in our own ways, so that people like Lola or my mother can actually become themselves. They don't have to live these stories or pretend to live these stories. They can tell their own story, and that's very empowering. The other thing we do is we do curriculum and lesson plans, pre-university. We're looking at pre-university. Asian American studies already cover universities, but we are doing things like this. This is the lesson plans, and we work with people at the uh, different, uh, we're trying to develop collaborations with uh, other uh, people interested in education, whether it's Park Service or Forest Service or National Endowment. It's teaching the tough stuff. How do we create lesson plans? The other thing we try to do is build uh, 1882 symposium is how do we build the networks of collaborations so that the several Asian American institutions and museums around the country, how can they best share their products? and then make it more effective and make the experience, the visitor experience, that much more. For example, electronically, how can you create museums without walls? What would be really nice is if there is a hub or a place at the nation's capital, say DC Chinatown. If you think about it, there's not a single, there's, not, there's no Chinese American museum, no Chinese American visitor center. But it would be wonderful if something like that were to exist. And there's a location right here that if people really wanted to support we try to do. So what can you do? Support our education and public awareness missions, support our National Chinatown Visitors Talk Story Center in Washington, D.C. Take a look at our website, which is sort of in a half construction stage. <laughs> and 
Yes, that's my mother. Uh, a few years, uh, a year before my father passed away, and two years before she did. But the bonus question is, what do Ozzy eat? It's sort of a joke because it's, I usually do this at lunchtime or snack time, and then people always say, "Oh, Chinese eat everything." <laughs> I said, "Well, wait a minute. You know, what do the Aussies eat?" <laughs> that's the question. So, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. I'll go ahead. And go. like this that explains the 1882 project, what we did politically, and it's there. And there are some things in here that explain a little bit more about uh, what our 1882 foundation is about. And those flyers are available um, on each of these tables, so if you'd like to get some of those afterwards, um, you will find them there. Um, and now we'd like to um, give everyone a chance to have some questions. So, um, here we'll go. Mine's an easy one. Hers is more complicated. <laughs> <laughs> ask, how do you or and do you coordinate with some of the other the Chinese American uh, organizations? For example, there's a, there's one in Maryland I'm aware of, and I, I believe there's also one in Virginia. Do you, you coordinate or are you going to work with them? Are they interested in, in being a part of uh, your project? So one of the things that we did in the 1882 project was actually to gather together a grassroots group of key organizations that included Chinese American Citizens Alliance, these are national and Chinese organizations, Chinese American Citizens Alliance, the National House of Chinese Americans, Japanese American Citizens, the you know, Committee 100, uh, uh, who am I missing here, OCA, OCA Asian American Advocates, and we had pro bono support from Covington and Bur Burley. So that group uh, represents uh, some of the major national organizations, and other people that joined in the group included people like uh, APABA, which is a very large organization in Sacramento that came in. Uh, many people are trying to join. That group became the basis of the education program. And part of our whole theory is how do we keep these guys together to collaborate and build uh, the educational programs that we think is needed. There's a continuing education program. And that's part of what the symposium is. So once a year, we try to get as many organizations as we can get together to talk about how do we continue to tell the stories, uh, both within our organizations and also uh, in the school curriculum. So part of the curriculum development thing is to actually develop strategies and practice ideas about how do we approach Richmond, how do we approach uh, different state uh, education, education departments and so forth. So we would welcome more people, people's involvement. Thank you very much for sharing your mother's story with us. It is very interesting. I'm just curious about your mother's second uh, entry into the United States. How old was she? Did she have any difficulties in the second time? The second time, you know, uh, the uh, second time the War Brides Act had already passed, so it was legal for my for my father, who was a serviceman. Uh, uh, he was a GI. He served in the. Pacific actually fixing up weather stations in different places. But because he was a, a army, he could marry my mother and bring her into China under uh, in the United States, and there was no problem. Uh, the contrast, some the photographs is quite amazing. She comes in, there's a photograph of her in Hawaii with the lay and <laughs> all this stuff <laughs> compared to this other ones where she's thrown into the detention center in Angel Island. But uh, uh, that that cohort, that group of women that came in the, after the war, uh, there is so much that we as my generation of people, uh, Chinese Americans, owe to this group. And they're kind of not spoken about very much. Uh, they come in and they start the families. So if you remember in the, in the previous laws, you had a lot of workers come to work on different railroads. We didn't talk about that. A lot of them were workers and a lot of them were male, male people in the mines in the frontier part of the United States. If you exclude the women from coming in, then they can't form families. And then you have anti-miscegenation laws in the states. They can't marry. So you condemn them into these bachelor communities and they, they have this lonely existence or whatever they're trying to do. But 
once you bring in the families, then you have the ability to do, uh, have a normal life. And in many ways, that's what the 45, that's why the War Brides Act is so significant. I bet you, uh, I don't know if Stan or other people, my, many of the people of my age, their parents, the, they, mother, came under this act. And that made, that made a big difference. All the days leave. Well, my father came in as a paper son. Mm -hmm. And at some point, um, I guess the U.S. granted amnesty to mm -hmm. all those that came and he changed his name back to his original name. Mm -hmm. Do you know like what year that was and how that came about? That was sometime in the 1950s. I can't quite remember. But it's very controversial. If my mother had come in the first time, she would have been a paper daughter, just like mm -hmm. just like many of the people came. So these are the, all the paper sons that were able to take that story and get into the. So you have these guys that are you, 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 you that are not youngs; they're actually gongs, and they're not whatever. And then there was a period during the 1950s where the immigration and FBI wanted to regularize all the law, so they had an amnesty period. If you come out. Tell us who you really are, we're not going to bother you, but you've got to write these uh, family uh, diagrams. Uh, so many people did. Many people came and they got their names back. But a lot of people did not because they didn't trust, and there was a lot of controversy. I don't know if you know your family, people said. I feel like my father didn't change it until like the until, 80s. Until the 80s. 1980s. So. No, I think it was. Was there some new law that came about? No, it was probably. Uh, I'm not totally sure, but it was maybe. Maybe it was in the. Uh, uh, maybe it's the late 60s. But I don't think it was in the 80s. Hmm. But it was. Uh, uh, but it was a lot of controversy. Still, families are split. It says you can't do this because they're going to track down my cousin, my other people, things like that. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people changed it. Thank you very much for sharing all these stories and this history with us. Um, my question concern is textbooks. Um, lately we hear a lot about whitewashing history or using euphemisms to describe slavery and other sli um, shameful acts in American history. Have you seen that with the Chinese Exclusion Act and how it's being taught in schools? And if so, what is the 1882 Foundation doing to correct the record? So, one of the, that, that's Thank you. Four, one of the four topics we want to deal with in our curriculum lesson plan and stuff. When I was growing up in California, uh, I don't know about you guys, but there was very, not very much said about Chinese exclusion laws or even the details of Chinese immigration and so forth. In California, we have a almost two, two almost a couple of pages on the Donner, the Donner, the Donner incident. I don't know if any of you guys know what the Donner incident was. That was these pioneers crossing the United States and they got stuck in a place near Lake Tahoe during the middle of a terrible winter and they got, they died and it was cannibalism. And it's a big story about the heroism of the westward movement and all this sort of stuff. But within, from Donner Pass, you can actually see the summit tunnel. The tunnel was the tunnel that was created by the Chinese uh, la the laborers to build the first transcontinental <coughs> railroad. That tunnel is within sight of, of the Donner, Donner Pass area. That tunnel, the highest tunnel of a series of tunnels built through sheer granite. Now, we need to tell these stories in this way. That, that tunnel was three football fields long. And if anybody knows what Lake Tahoe looks like in the mountain, it's that granite. It's just pure granite. And in those days when it was, that tunnel was built in 1860, 768, something like that, they, they didn't have power tools. They only had shovels there. There were almost 8,000 Chinese building that railroad. And when that railroad was being built, three, three football fields long, of course they started from the east side and the west side to meet in the middle, right, to save time. But in order to save time, they actually dug a tunnel straight down the middle. And then they built outward. Can you imagine what that engineering feat was like? And then when they joined the thing, it was less than a few inches off in terms of gradient and so forth. 8,000, almost 10,000 Chinese were on that, engineers. And they didn't, they just used picks, axes, wheelbarrows. They didn't even have dynamite, it was gunpowder. And they began to experiment with something called nitroglycerin. You know, like, and then they built it during the, the dead of the same, of winter, much like the Donner Pass got caught in, in the winter. This snow was one of the most terrible snows. 
they had to build, tunnel through the snow, and they actually built places where they lived underneath the snow to get to the sites then. That story of the building of this railroad, and this railroad is one of three projects that Abraham Lincoln said was important to unite the nation. Homestead Act, the uh, Land Grants Act, and the Pacific Railroad. So important for the, uh, for the nation. And it never merited one paragraph in my history books, right? So the, what we would like to do is get that story out, get people to realize that those stories are there and the significance of those stories. Mm -hmm. Not just in terms of, say, the oppression of the Chinese and the ethnic group, but for the building of the nation mm -hmm. and how it is so importantly part of the American, uh, <coughs> the American nation. It's the whole history of us. And so that, so thank you for that question. That's actually a very key part of what we're trying to do, is to make sure that the story is not just this as you say, a whitewash story of an American movement west, but it's actually the filling in of this, of this continent which becomes the American nation. Okay, we have time for about uh, one, maybe two more questions. So, um, one here, and is there anyone else who wanted to ask a question? Okay. I wanted to ask if you have met Mr. Ed Lee, who is the first Asian a mayor of San Francisco since you grew up in No, I haven't met him. I, I haven't met him, but uh, it's really amazing now that we have a, a Chinese mayor in a place that, China, you know, the, before the 1882 project uh, got the Congress to apologize, uh, two years before that, San Francisco apologized for their ordinance. And they had a lot of ordinance against the Chinese, things like uh, Q acts and things like you couldn't wear laundry, you couldn't carry laundry on poles. All sorts of weird stuff, but uh, they had apologized, and, and uh, the state of California apologized a year later, and then we then followed up with the apology in the Congress. It'd be uh, nice to have uh, Ed Lee come out here and give us a talk what he thinks uh, being the first Chinese American is uh, is fine. So welcome him. Come if you, you're a friend, Tom, come over here and do a talk story for us. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so um, we, we've come up around, oh, okay, one last question, and uh, we're just about at 6.30, so after this, we'll, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Okay, Ben, Ben, thanks again for the wonderful presentation, very enlightening. Um, you, you, you're aware of what's going on, as, as well as everyone in the room, politically right now, and you know that certain presumptive candidate or president has made lots of comments about excluding certain groups. Uh, from coming to the United States, and I was wondering if the 1882 Foundation is taking a position on any of these issues or is working with others um, with regard to some of those comments or uh, the ideas of excluding various groups from the United States. So, of course, 1882 is a 501c3 political organization, right? And uh, uh, we don't necessarily want to take a position on these things, but I would say this, that, uh, you know, the stuff which uh, uh, certain candidates are saying, say, you know, you really ought to dump them <laughs> in some way, it is no, it's, it's almost like when the 1882 law was being uh, 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 passed by Congress, one of the things was a guy named Dennis Kearney, one of the, he was the a sand light, sand lot politician agitating thing. He coined the phrase, the Chinese must go. Everything and everything was involved in everything that was ill, everything that was bad about, about California and the West Coast was uh, caused by the Chinese. And he agitated all that. And I don't think we need anyone else to sort of like redo that kind of a thinking process mm -hmm. or to get the masses to stir it up in that way again. And uh, uh, this country should be better than that. We should be not if anything we if we've learned anything, it is not a country of exclusion that makes us strong. It's it's not a divide, we should not be advocating those kind of divisive uh, it, uh, policies. The thing that makes us strong is the diversity that we bring in. And in fact, you know, the whole idea, as I said, this country was made by all of us, mm -hmm. not just that we were here uh, as somebody's laborer to do something which uh, a bunch of white guys wanted to do. Or 
some people want to do. <laughs> it was made by all of us. We each have a right to be uh, uh, said and not acknowledged. And anybody that says we aren't or should be excluded is uh, uh, just wrong. You, know, you don't want to. There, there's more, there's so much, uh, you know, some of the, I really don't want to get into too, too many things, but there's more parallel between what is going on with uh, Trump and this sort of stuff as, uh, say, maybe the uh, Weimar Republic actually during the 1930s, mm -hmm. I think. So they can, people need to be careful. Okay, well, I'd um, like to uh, thank Mr. Gong for his very enlightening uh, speech.